Don't hire the air test company to come out and pre-test to tell you that you have mold when you can already physically see it. Because a lot of mold is not covered under insurance companies, so this stuff can get very expensive and very quick. When you get labs and scientists involved, the price just go up. Welcome to the Property Management Brainstorm Show with Bob Preston. Bob is the president, owner, and broker of North County Property Group, the fastest growing and top-ranked property management company in North County, San Diego. This podcast is for property owners and investors who are considering hiring a professional property management company to manage their property assets. You'll hear from leading professionals on the best practices surrounding the San Diego rental market what's involved in successfully renting your property, and how to make sure your property is managed correctly. Now, here is your host, Bob Preston. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Property Management Brainstorm Podcast. This is Bob Preston, your host of the show, broadcasting from our studio at North County Property Group in Del Mar, California. On today's episode, We're going to discuss one of our planet's mightiest elements, water. While water is essential, obviously, for everyday life of ourselves, humans, animals, is a standard feature in every home, and it could even be a beautiful architectural treatment, it can also be incredibly destructive to a property. Our guest on the show today is the founder and president of one of our best partners here at North County Property Group, Jason Woodmer of KIC Restoration. He's become a regular visitor here at the office. He drops in every now and then. He's become a good friend of mine. And by the way, he's an uber smart dude. So thank you for being here today, Jason. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we appreciate all those little treats and all the pins and gizmos you bring in every now and then for us. But um, no, I mean that we've uh, had a pretty good partnership here. What's it been a couple of years now? We've worked together. Yes, well over two years already. Yeah. And sometimes we um, work on things that aren't you know, the most uh, pleasant to work on, but they're super important. It's important to get it right. So maybe uh, you can just introduce yourself a little bit. We met uh, a couple of years ago on a water incident that occurred at one of our properties. We were really impressed with you and your services of, of KIC, and we've been using you guys as a partner ever since. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, and how you got into this business. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me as a guest speaker today on (laughs) on your podcast. Well, a little bit about myself. I was actually raised in a small farming community in Watertown, Minnesota, back in- Minnesota. uh, I hear that a little bit now that you mentioned that. You betcha. But (laughs) how I got out to San Diego, I actually joined the military at the age of 18 years old, served in the military for 12 years as a nuclear machinist mate. I was a combat action veteran. I did two tours over in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Uh, A little bit about my company. Uh, KIC was founded in 1998. We are a a disabled veteran-owned corporation, a full-service restoration and reconstruction company serving all areas of San Diego. And my corporate headquarters is located in beautiful Poway, California. I've been married for 25 years the father of three beautiful children. Very happy to be living in San Diego as long as I have. (laughs) Okay. You started working very young. And I think I read in your background that this line of work you even even were doing in the Navy a little bit, um, handling hazardous materials. I think it's asbestos, right? That you were involved in perhaps? That is correct. So I was what they call a propulsion engineer. So I worked down in the engineering plants and a lot of the piping and valve assemblies down there back in in the 80s a lot of the steam pipes were wrapped with an asbestos containing material so from time to time we'd have to do repairs on the ship so we'd actually have to to abate the lagging wrapping around the steam pipes prior to performing our work so is that kind of the genesis of how this KIC company now known as KIC, is that where things started or how would you describe that? That is where I, I understood the general knowledge and you know got some of my preliminary certifications that just unilateraled out to the civilian world when, when I in fact got out of active duty status of the military. Another way I got into this line of work was actually... Prior to being in restoration, I owned a cleaning company. 
Okay. So we serviced all areas. Highly related to, to this line of business. Over a period of time, after about two years of being in the cleaning industry, it got more and more known that because I had the keys to the building, 24-hour access, that building owners or property managers would start calling me because they would have a water leak. And since I was doing their carpet cleaning for them in their buildings and was always sucking out water, that was the first person they would think of. And they would call me to come suck water out of their carpets. And that's how I first, actually- First guy on the job, sure. That's and that, and that's actually, sometimes the most important <laughs> time is to get it so done I, quickly. I started with cleaning company and then segued into carpet cleaning. And then you know, by the early 2000s, I had pretty much- got out of slowly doing cleaning and more focusing on on the restoration. That's interesting. And I always enjoy food. hearing people's stories about their journeys and stuff. So today, uh, what is the proper term uh, of of what KIC does? Is it you're a property restoration company? Is there a – just to make sure I have the right vernacular as we so, continue on. So we are, we are in the industry what is known as a full-service restoration company, meaning that – we are certified to do all phases of restoration, whether it be fire restoration, water restoration, mold restoration, or what they call biohazard cleanup restoration. Sure. Okay. So we are a certified firm in all aspects of the certifications needed to do this type of work. And also, I'm a licensed general contractor. So not only can we do the mitigation work, get rid of the water, dry the structure, get rid of the mold, get rid of the smoke or the char burn from the fire. We sure. can also put it all back together as a licensed general contractor in the so state of California. So from A to Z, so to speak. Okay. So for the purposes of today's episode, to get into some of that other stuff, fire, biohazard, we'd be, you know, we'd be here all day. So can't do that. So let's focus on water, if that's okay with sure. you today. It's like I mentioned, it's kind of the topic of the show. And this is a very broad question <laughs> and maybe too general, but I'm hoping you can drill down a little bit. Water intrusion. I think that's what we would call it. It could come from leaks. It can come from rain. It can come from the sprinkler system outside, whatever. What are the most common, I, I guess, examples of water intrusion into a residential home that you know you see, I guess, out there every day, right? You're out in the trenches. Two of the biggest ones in the water mitigation industry yeah. to where we come out and inspect. Well, I'd say one of our biggest ones are failing water heaters. Yes. Due to the hard calcified water. That, that seems to be an issue in this town, right? Because the water uh, is not of the greatest. Well, I guess it's okay quality, but it just has a lot of mineral, high mineral, well, high mineral content. And then by them adding the, the chlorine and everything to keep the levels of bacteria, that combination over time, just wreaks havoc on plumbing, copper piping, faucets, water heaters, dishwashers. And all those things you just rattled off are all culprits. Correct. Right? They're all sources of water losses. Okay. All right. So water heaters, what else do you do you see? Uh, another big thing it's that I, I tell customers, and it's very cheap insurance because water can do a severe amount of damage very quickly. Especially if you're not home yep. and something would happen. Uh, the cheapest ways of insurance that you can just general maintenance, angle stops and supply lines. So the angle stop is the fitting that supplies water to your fixture. Your it's sink, a little valve. To your toilet. Yeah. Yes. A lot of the older homes have what they call a stem style angle stop valve, which are very prone to failing and leaking. Those are the kind you turn to the left or the right, kind of like a knob, right? Yes, that you turn. We recommend removing and replacing those all with the new quarter turn style angle stop valves. They're less prone to fail, leak, or even blow off the wall Sure, completely like the older style angle stops, the stem style. Would. Okay. Now this last winter, we had severe rain. <laughs> I'm sure you got Very a lot ample. of calls, unusual stuff, right? So yes. uh, not the norm here in San Diego, which is kind of part of the problem because a lot of homeowners don't even realize they might have an issue with their roof until we have that kind of a rainy season. Correct. And especially in my career of over over 20 years of doing this, with this last year, with the with the amount of rain 
and the win that we had, there were a lot of problems that people had with their roofs that normally in San Diego, they wouldn't have these type of problems. It'd be more prone to the Midwest where they have in in the South where they have the heavier torrential rains and the real high winds that are really pretty much other than a Santa Ana once in a while. It's very abnormal out here. Uh, I saw a lot of wind pushing water into areas and coming into a, into properties that normally would never even leak. And we had one of those this season, right? Yes, uh, we did. Out in Rancho Penasquitos. Well, you know, you just gave me a great idea for another episode. Maybe you can come back someday and we'll do one regarding prevention, right? Because that's a big part of this too, is making sure. Would love to do yeah. That. Okay. So we'll do that another day. This may seem like an obvious question and I don't mean to ask uh, obvious dumb questions, but what would the signs be of water intrusion? That's actually a great question okay. because a lot of people don't even realize they have a problem when they actually do. So mm -hmm. having knowledge of what to look for can really minimize the extent of damage you can potentially, sure. it could potentially okay. create if it goes unnoticed. The big things are, I've got a little water stain in my ceiling. Sure. Another one is my wall looks like the paint or the drywall is bubbling out. It looks like you have blistering on your walls. I've seen that on ceilings too. Correct. Correct. Another thing is, is my tile in my kitchen are loose and starting to pop up. Or could be hot. Which is what, what I right? was alluding okay, to next. Yeah, when I, right. And another one is I'm walking on my tile floor with my bare feet and my floor is warm. That would give an indication that you have a slab leak. Yeah, of on a hot the hot water, water on side. A, which it's interesting. I mean, hot water seems to be the one that often will go, right? Correct. Hot water due to the to the physics and, and thermo transfer, the hot sides are always more prone to fail than the cold side. Why is that? Just uh, science. Chemical science. chemical reaction. I know that hot water atoms move faster and maybe And the know. chemical breakdown and the characteristic changes mm -hmm. when you heat water up with the minerals and the chemicals that are in them probably causes it to be more on the corrosive side. Interesting. We've had a handful of slab leaks in the company's, you know, long history and it's always been hot water. Yeah. So that's good to know, right? It's uh, very interesting. Okay. So if I'm a resident at a property, a tenant or maybe a homeowner, uh, or your friendly property manage manager, right? Yes. And I suspect that there might be water intrusion. What should I do? First thing you should do is, if you think you have an active pressurized water leak, the first thing you should do to stop the damage is to turn your water off. Okay. After you turn your water off, I would recommend you call a competent plumber that you're that you feel safe based on either a recommendation from a family friend or right or go online like I tell my customers know who's going to be working in your house do research on them before you allow them to come in and do work and pay them right right and by the way if if one of our tenants is listening to this call us <laughs> let us be the one who to recommend the next step but call us quickly <laughs> please correct furthermore always make sure that whoever is working in your house has a California contractor state license, they have liability insurance, and they have a bond. Right. Because if they don't have those things, you have no recourse legally in the state of California to go back on them. If they cut your wall open and they blow something, make it worse, right? Okay. So um, in a water leak, time is of the essence, obviously, Correct. right? And, so And why? Your, why is time of the essence? Because the longer that the water intrudes into your property, the more damage it's potentially doing. Spreads out. So as we say in the industry, first, we want to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. So you turn the water off. You would then call a plumber. Get the plumber out to assess the situation. Find out where the cause of the leak is coming from. Have the plumber go ahead and address that. Fix the problem. Get your water back on. Then I would recommend that you call a licensed and certified restoration contractor, hopefully KIC restoration, mm -hmm. to come out and give an inspection and do what we call in the industry as a moisture mapping of your home to find out what the actual impact of the damage to your property is. 
Water is one of the most interesting proof points that gravity does exist on our planet, right? Because, I mean, basically, the water will just run to the lowest point where gravity is pulling it. And so one thing I've noticed in my years of experience is that an owner or a tenant will say, well, the leak's right here because that's where I see the water damage. But that's not always the case, right? It could be on the opposite end of the, the, the room or of the house, and it just finds its way in that direction until it can come down. That is a very accurate statement. Water will travel the least flow of resistance, so it will just go wherever. And a lot of times you have to open a bunch of things up because sometimes when you open where you think it was leaking and the water's dripping out of actually isn't where the source, like you said, is coming from. And what I've seen, and I don't know, you're the professional here, is that when water's flowing quickly, it, it's flowing. So it's not really having a chance to sit there and absorb and necessarily leak into things maybe as badly as it might if it's pooling or there's accumulation in a, play, in a spot, I guess. Correct. And another thing is you got to keep in mind that building material is like a big sponge. So drywall is absorbent and will absorb yes. a lot of water. Insulation will absorb a lot of water. Yes. Doug fir wood, which most of these buildings are built with, will absorb a lot of water. Especially older ones that are dry. And that are dry. So taking in carpet, carpet pad, wood subfloor, all these things are very absorbent. So sometimes when you see, oh, well, it's just a little bit of damage, by the time we get done doing our inspection, doing our moisture mapping, and doing a forensic documented inspection report, showing all the signs of the water damage people are i've heard this a thousand times oh my gosh i didn't realize there was that much damage sure and it's very very important to mitigate and get all the saturated building material out and get your structure dry as quickly as possible to prevent the uh, potential of microbial growth starting to grow sure we're going to touch on that here in a minute but Oftentimes, someone may not even know how long it's been leaking because it could be that it's been leaking in there for quite some time, but only recently has presented itself. Now, you mentioned moisture mapping. I'd like a couple of the tricks of your trade here. So you have specialized equipment. I think you can, you have these probes and you also have some sort of a infrared device. Yes, we have. So we have what they call in the industry is it's a flare infrared camera that will allow us to do infrared pictures Mm -hmm. so we can get a general idea because with infrared it will show a darker color where all the water impaction is going to be so you can kind of segue and figure out what isn't metal and what is actually really water sure because on some of these other types of meters like my pinpoint meters if you poke those into the wall and you hit metal it can give you a false reading right there's other contributing factors. A lot of these higher end homes have wallpaper in it. A lot of the higher end wallpapers have a metal foil backing on it. Interesting. So when you're doing your moisture mapping and you stick your probe in through the wallpaper into the wall to check, it can give you a false reading because- a green board, like the green, does that offer some moisture resistance? Yes, it does. Okay. But the way I was taught and- in my years of experience in doing this, water will break down everything. Nothing even waterproofing over time. The, even waterproofing over 50, 60, 70 years of overexposure, it will break it down. There is nothing known to mankind that is bulletproof. Powerful element for sure. Okay. You mentioned microbial growth a minute ago. This is one of the reasons also why time is of the essence, because I understand mold can form in as quickly as 72 hours. I think you told me this one time. <laughs> Thank Potentially you. in, in okay. an ideal situation, it, okay. can, it can start to incubate and grow in as little as 72 hours. Okay. Yeah. But certainly that's one reason why you don't want to screw around. If you think you have a leak, jump on it, get us involved if we're your property management company, get Jason and KIC involved if uh, you, know, you own a home. Now, mold's received a lot of attention. You know, yes, on the has. news and, you know, health risks sort of, uh, yeah, health risk concerns, all these kind of things. What's the big deal? What's the big fuss about mold? So with mold, um, first of all, you got to look at this with at a 360 degree foot level. When we're outside walking, we're breathing mold spores in all the time outside sure. in the ambient exists, air space. It exists in our environment. It does. Everywhere. Sure. 
Especially on the coast, right? Yeah. yeah. We eat mold. Jeez. Sure. It's this that rule of thumb that, you know, the wise man once said, too much of anything isn't good for you. Mm-hmm. It really, in my 20 years of doing a lot of mold work and having some very, very big specialized projects over the course of my career that we had to figure out and get clearance tests on, every human body is different. It's just like yeah. medication. Some medication works on one human body and it doesn't work on another. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same analogy with mold. I've had people that have been living in a science project for years and never. <laughs> my daughter's backpack, are, yeah. <laughs> you're a soccer bag. Like my, yeah, <laughs> right. that's, a, that's a science project. Looking back at all the situations I've had, we've had, like I said, situations where they've been living in a science project. And it's like, I'm looking like, how can you guys even be living in here? Yeah. And they are perfectly healthy. No problems. And then I've had other situations where just a little bit of exposure and the customer starts getting lesions, open sores, respiratory respiratory problems from the microtoxins associated with overexposure of mold. Now we're not, at least I don't think you're a microbiologist. I'm not a microbiologist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a microbiologist, so I don't want to get too carried away here. But from what I understand, are there different types of molds? There are, of, you, you might know a little bit about this, like yes. and, and which ones are you know, gnarlier so, than others, I guess. Yes. So there are hundreds of different types of mold spore strains. The four biggest ones that are of a risk in the air industry, because we go out to all these jobs, we got to get air clearances. So I'm constantly talking to air testing people, microbiologists. Sure, yeah. And yeah, you're looking I, at the results of what comes correct, back. From and then your we jobs. peer review the results together. The four known mold spores that are the real bad ones with number one being the Stachybordius. Short term is called in the industry, we call it stacky. That's that's the black, nasty one. Okay, so black mold can be that's the one that really can get people sick, proven by Mm -hmm. health and studies and and, Mm -hmm. and research. The other ones that are uh, that can be a a respiratory irritant and can cause rashes and and lesions, like like I had stated earlier. The two other strains are what they call an aspergillus penicillium are the two other types of strains. And then the last one being cladosporium. That's the least harmful of the four. Okay. So to our listeners, you know, don't expect Jason or I to walk into your house and identify these things on the spot. That's not going to happen because we're not, you know, we don't have Petri dishes and we're not scientists. But I mean, it's just important to understand that there are, you know, significant risks to this kind of thing. What about the length of exposure? I think that that might have something to do with kind of health risks as well? Correct. Like I'd stated earlier, there's some people that are very hypersensitive and then some people that don't have any health problems or concerns at Mm -hmm. all. Usually what I always recommend, because here at KIC, as the owner and founder and probably more prone even with my ex-military background, is attention to detail and health and safety. Yeah. Those are my being biggest. Being conservative and, and uh, being thorough. Correct. Right. So when you walk into these properties, like I tell my staff, you have to look at it with an eye towards, you got to treat this like this, your mother or one of your loved family members is living here. And that's how we need to treat every customer. Sure. Because it portrays well. Be listening. Listen to the to the tenant or, or the homeowner's concerns. Be receptive. Answer the questions they they ask because, you know, a lot of people, they have a a disaster like this, you know, and they're caught off guard. Their world's turned upside down, you know, and most of the time when you get into mold, a lot of times you're displaced from your home. So Mm -hmm. you're actually removing people out of their house, you know, to get everything mitigated, contained, mitigated, cleaned up with an air clearance and get them back into it. Yeah, I want to talk about what you just mentioned too in the context of kind of what is the entire process, right? So I, when I think of you, I think of that farmer's commercial, you know, we know a thing or two because we've seen, seen a thing, thing or two, two, right? That's kind of a, the catchphrase for them now. Yes. But you have, and yes. um, we're in the property management business. All the properties we bring you in on typically have a tenant. 
And so for owners of properties who are thinking about becoming landlords out there, just realize if something like this comes down, it's sometimes a very lengthy process, one in which you may not be able to expect your tenant to actually stick it out. And in some cases, there could be dehumidifiers, fans, lengthy dry out process, maybe kitchens, bathrooms might be shut down. And it essentially, from a practical standpoint, is uninhabitable. So, Sewage loss. Yeah, right. Exactly. You're not going back. Right. So these things are, are real. So I think owners of or, or property investors just need to be realizing that when they, when they rent to somebody that, you know, there might be cases where you have to allow somebody to break their lease or very minimum go live someplace else temporarily when when uh, this is going on and there might be rent abatement uh, in the process. So let's go back to my original thought is very general case here. I know everyone's unique. Everyone's different. Leaks come from different places. Damage is different. But run us through the process. Like you said, A to Z earlier, like when you first arrive at a property, you're evaluating something to the point where that property is now ready for full live-in, move-in, everything's put back together. All right. So the call come in either from the property manager or a customer that Googled me on online Mm -hmm. or a previous customer. We get a lot of people, unfortunately, that have another problem and they they call us back, which from a business standpoint, that's a great thing because their first experience they had was great. And I'm honored that they called me back again. So with that being said, uh, first thing we do, the phone call comes in, we book a time for an inspection that's convenient if it's an immediate oh my gosh which i've had a thousand of them do you guys do after hours and weekends 24 hours a day you kind of have to be in your business 365 days a year right and the 2 a.m calls are never at a good time well they're never fun but it it can happen but and that's the business we signed up to do we're in the service Mm -hmm. emergency services business yeah just like a fireman just like an ambulance, the except rings, we're, sure. but we're on the other side. So we'll get the call. If it requires immediate water removal, we will deploy a truck out with a team to start moving contents and start extracting water and going through the process. And this is kind of what you referred to earlier, like sucking up water with vacuums. Correct. You have, you guys it's have called really water extraction. Water extraction. Okay. Yeah. So- what I will do first is I will introduce myself, get a work off sign, get the team to start extracting the water. And then I, myself, or one of my um, estimators will start doing their moisture map mapping, taking a detailed forensic documentation report, showing the water damaged areas, showing elevated moisture levels with the readings of our equipment and kind of writing the story with the inspection report for either the homeowner most most water losses are covered by insurance companies so we're at that time creating the inspection report for the homeowner and for the insurance carrier now, i've seen your inspection reports because you've done several for us they're they're very comprehensive they have obviously moisture levels photographs yes and then at what point do you need to start exploring i guess So what we will do first, there's a lot of variables we have to, before we can break into any structure in the state of California, we can't break drywall open without testing under two circumstances. One, it being 84 or older. You're talking about 1984. 1984. 1984, If the dwelling is 1984 or older, we'd have to do what they call lead and asbestos sampling prior to demoing any building material. Really? The other thing that just came out into law at the beginning of this year, any dwelling apartments that have three or more attached units in one dwelling, you automatically have to get lead and asbestos testing. Does not matter what age the year it was built. Any commercial building now. Doesn't matter if it was built last year. Okay, so you guys aren't allowed to just start cannot, cutting open walls. No, uh, you have to. You have to get your clearance before within the gu- the state and federal guidelines. And how long does that take usually? So what we'll do if, if the loss is on a weekend, labs are closed on the weekend. Mm-hmm. So what we'll do is I'll get my my testing company out. We'll pull samples on a Saturday or a Sunday, 
and get them so that way they're turned into the lab Monday morning. So by Monday afternoon, we have results and we can start planning our job outline for the job to go into recovery state. And in the meantime, what we will do, we will extract as much water as we can, pull out the wet carpet, pull out the wet pad. If there's laminate flooring that's clicked, we can remove that. We just can't break building material. So, and then what we'll do is we'll temporarily deploy some DHUs, some air movers to start controlling the environment and starting the recovery stage until we get our test results to open and complete. Our okay. Demo. So you're, yeah, that starts the dry out. So you're talking about putting fans in to circulate the air, dehumidifiers to start pulling water and, Correct. you know, getting it um, out of the area. Let's now say you get your clearance, no asbestos. No, no asbestos. Yeah. So then what I'll do is- Wait, I'll- I have a question before you go there. Sorry to interrupt. What if you get on site and there's visible signs of mold? Like, right, sometimes you might be able to see it. Do you take mold samples or you get into that or so, that's all later? What, it's take a, sideways it's a very, a very good question. Okay. All right. So there's two parts of my inspections when we go out to do a mold inspection. You have your visual and then you have your air test. So those two, if you can physically see black mold growing on the wall, in my opinion, and my professional recommendation, what I recommend to my customers, don't hire the air test team company to come out and pre-test to tell you that you have mold when you can already physically see it. Right. Because a lot of mold is not covered under insurance companies. So this stuff can get very expensive and very quick when you get labs and scientists involved the price just go up do you do you try to encase the area so what we will do if i go out for an inspection and i deem that there's you know evidence of a major amount of microbial growth then what i will do after my inspection is i will go back to my truck get some plastic get some tape and contain the area right over with plastic just so it doesn't continue to keep floating and becoming airborne right until we can set up for the mitigation right it the keeps demo. the rest of the environment uh, presumably more healthy for more, more he- healthy okay so now thank you for answering that if you now have the clearance on asbestos lead what are your next steps again generically so what we'll do is I'd send the team up and we're going to set up what they call a controlled environment which is a containment it acts as two purposes. I'm not going to be turning the rest of the house into a dust cloud. Mm -hmm. I've got a controlled environment. And furthermore, once we start the dry out process, it acts as a drying chamber. So it increases the drying efficiency. So rather than having equipment in your house for eight or nine days, like we used to back in the day, a standard dry out now is only three to four days for us. Right. You're not sucking the moisture out of the Pacific Ocean. You're you're, you're, you're focused right on the- Pinpoint uh, drying is what I explain to my customers. Okay. So, and it's very, very, we get great results. Okay. So you're now at this point cutting open walls, you're pulling out insulation, perhaps. I mean, it obviously depends upon what you found. Correct. Taking. Sometimes I understand there's just sort of holes that are cut, I guess. I don't know if you guys still do it that way that will potentially. So we'll come in and we'll do based on, on the amount of extent of damage. Usually it, it requires a one to a two foot flood cut of like of a perimeter of a room. If you Mm -hmm. had impacted damage, if the water loss came from the upstairs, a lot of times there'll be a ceiling above where the water loss occurred, usually above a bathroom yeah, or a big custom thousand gallon aquarium that broke <laughs> i've had them all all shapes and sizes that happened to me we won't go there <laughs> it wasn't a thousand but it was i think 300 and salt it was water. salt water yes yeah glass. very corrosive yeah, yeah right anyway we'll talk about that someday over a beer I think. <laughs> yeah you've opened up things you're starting to dry out you've got so, containment sort of so we chamber a, if you will we right? have our drying chamber we'll do all the demo after the demo's completed we'll come in we'll HEPA vacuum the whole area to remove all the dust then we will come in with an antimicrobial agent it's an industry standard and even just regular general water losses where we'll spray a disinfectant over all the wood the floor all the areas where the water came in contact with something then we take microfiber rags, okay. 
will wipe the whole area down. Okay, so you might even see mold on the on the timbers inside the wall. Correct. Right and, the frame, you know? and it's great you brought that up because a lot of times we open the walls and there'll be little black spotting on it's that way at Home Depot. <laughs> right. And that that in the industry, what they call is called lumber mold. Okay. It's very, very common. It's not toxic. It's not a yeah. health hazard. It's contained inside the wall. And it's Different. in the walls. It just happens because when you build a structure, the builders don't stop. They start rough framing. They come back the next day. It's still moist out. They start. Could be winter. It's raining. Yeah, correct. Yeah, sure. Their objective is to get the structure built, not to make sure the moisture content is in the structural building material. And that's where the lumber mold comes from. All right. So you've sprayed it. You've got uh, cleaned anti- it. Cleaned it. it. Um, now we're into three to three to five days or standard drying time. Right. And now you're probably at a point where you could call in for the microbial test. So if it had mold by then, we'll dry the structure because that is one part of the air clearance. When the lab comes in, they check, they check your structural building material to make sure it's within this industry standard guidelines okay. prior to even doing the, the air test. If you have elevated moisture anywhere in your in your lumber, they'll fail you right on the spot. They won't even take the sample. Right. Until you're fully dry. Correct. So, okay. so we get the dry. And then what we will do is if we have an air test, I will send my detail team in and we will tape off all the stud cavities with plastic because we can't have any other influences from attics or crawl spaces or anything Mm -hmm. that would give an improper reading or influence the air test in a negative way. Mm -hmm. So we will contain what we need to contain. Then we will do another half of vacuum of the complete contained area, ceilings, floors, walls, stud cavities, a wet wiping. We will deploy a, a HEPA air scrubber in the containment and run it for another 24 hours. And then we will call the lab to come out and do the air test. Okay. So I would, I would guess at this point, let's say the air test proves you're clean, Clean. you're good. So this sort of what you've described now, would you say that's sort of the first phase? That's the, that's phase one of the mitigation. Okay. So uh, you mentioned earlier insurance, you know more about what insurance will and will not cover. But I think that the, typically, they will usually cover that sort of initial phase without getting to... But A lot of older homeowners policies still have what they call a mold writer coverage oh, policy okay. within their homeowners policy. And most of them are between $5,000 and a $10,000 cap. So if we get into a problem and all of a sudden there's a bunch of mold in there too... Sometimes we have to go back to the insurance carrier with forensic documentation saying, hey, we've got some mold in here. It's not just a water loss now. We've got some additional work and some additional protocols we need to follow to get this clean. Some cases it's covered. And unfortunately, in some cases, it's not covered. So this is really important for our listeners to make sure what their policy says. Because the other thing I know, uh, because I've seen a thing or two also, is that if it's an emergent leak, in other words, all of a sudden, if something happens and you sudden spring loss. a leak, sudden loss, that's okay, the that's the verbiage term. of the versus maybe a pinhole leak that's been happening in there. Maybe there is deferred maintenance on the property. You didn't do anything about it. If it sits there and they open it up and there's dry rot and there's some stuff like this, that typically would not be covered, right? Am I so, correct about that? I've had them both. So usually the dishwasher supply line ruptures, the toilet overflows, uh, angle stop supply line my shower valve behind my wall failed when i turned it on and now i got water downstairs those are all covered assuming you act quickly if, yes. if you don't act quickly you could get yourself uh yes. get very expensive right if you don't act on it right away you do take the chance of your insurance carrier coming back to you and saying you should have called us right away when this happened. Mm-hmm. You are way too far down the rabbit hole now, and there's so much other damage that was caused by you not notifying us right away when you have a, had the problem. Therefore, it's neglect on your part, and yeah. we are going to deny the claim. Okay. And now you as the homeowner 
are stuck with the full financial responsibility to of getting your home back to a pre-loss right. condition. Now, when you were describing kind of the process of, you know, sealing and containing the area and all that and the dehumidifier, I mean, the insurance companies, they want you to do it correctly. Correct. Right. So it may seem a little uh, overboard, ex- overboard at times, but that is what the insurance companies are paying you to make sure that it gets treated properly, that you're clean. And then, okay, now let's talk about putting it back together. Liability. Am I, yeah, right. Because they don't want it. So, so look, if you've got an insurance claim out there as a homeowner and it's going to be covered, let these guys do it the way they know how to do it. They're, they're professionals. They know. When you hire KIC, that's what we do. We fight. We're very transparent, but we are going to fight on your behalf to make sure that you are made whole from your insurance carrier. Because we have the software to write the estimates just like the insurance carriers do. It's called a software program called Xactimate. Right. We use it. (laughs) If you're in the insurance industry, you primarily have to use it to be a preferred vendor for insurance carriers. Otherwise, it's an estimator's nightmare to come to an agreement on a cost. Okay. So in a typical scenario, this is sort of what we were talking about. You're what, maybe 10 days in at this point in time. And that's if everything goes swimmingly. Smooth. That's, yeah. that's you know, the asbestos testing, uh, a, g- a general water loss from start to finish is like you said, usually five to 10 days and we've got it dry and cleared and ready to be reconstructed. Okay. So now- what do you want to build it back as? There are some. There might be some homeowner decisions about materials. Assuming you've you've had to tear some stuff out. Correct. There might be insurance limitations on what they're willing to pay for the insurance company. You guys could do it, right? That's one option. Uh, yes, and uh, I, we do this all the time. We'll get an '80s kitchen that we rip the whole kitchen out, mm-hmm. but we the insurance company makes us save the face frames and the doors and drawers, and they'll pay us money to put it all back together, use the existing door and drawer fronts, and then restain everything. And a lot of times now my customers will, I'll go, do you want to do it like this and have your old kitchen? Or do you want to take all that money that the insurance company is paying you and get you a brand new kitchen? Apply it towards what will probably what, cost more money, but at least you're at the same You're time. upgrading yeah. now. And, right. and now it's, instead of it being $20,000, you might only have to pay 2500 out of your pocket to have a brand new kitchen. Okay. All right. So then you guys might do that. Sometimes insurance companies might bring in another contractor to mm. bid, right? Yes. I am a preferred network provider. So a lot of times people that aren't on the network that are doing work, a lot of times the, the big insurance carriers will ask me to come in and do what they call a comp bid to make sure that they're paying what this they're is how, supposed to this be is, paying. This is how we met you. You actually came did in comp, uh, after Paul bid. Davis. Yes. You came in and did a comp bid and ended up getting the job. Yes. And that's how we first met. So, okay. So, you know what the insurance companies are going to want from you. You know kind of the drill. And yes. So, another benefit of using KIC. Okay. God, this has been, I could go on talking to you about this kind of stuff all day. We could get into fire. We could get into all these other categories, but unfortunately we're at the uh, kind of the lengthy end of a typical podcast here. So I'm going to start to close this down, but I guess any last comments, tips, pointers to our listeners take away from this? We've covered a lot of ground today. Really, really good information, Jason. Anything else you'd like to? I just want to um, remind your guests the best piece of advice I guess I can give you a recommendation is make sure whoever is working in your house is licensed in the state (laughs) of California. Insured. (laughs) Insured and has a bond. Yes. And source, whether that's Google, you can go to the CSLB um, website, Mm -hmm. uh, type in the contractor's license number, and it will pull the whole history of the contractor up that you are thinking about letting work in your house. Yeah, don't hire your handyman and, to, uh, from down the street. Right? And in the state of California, and it's one of the biggest abused rules there is, but the law states that any non-licensed contractor cannot do any work 
on any property to exceed $500. That means the total value of the job on the property in a whole can only be $500. Right. And I see it all the time. And I've gotten a lot of floods over the years where a handyman will come in and think something and the homeowner doesn't know because they're not the contractor. They just think this guy is knows what he's doing. And unfortunately, he doesn't. And I've had cases where I've had handyman do north of $100,000 in damage to and they're a property. they're not licensed and they're probably not insured. And they're not now as unfortunately, you have no recourse to fall back on. So listen, if any of our listeners wanted to get in touch with you or KIC, how would they go about doing that? Yes. Uh, there's a few ways you can reach me. I have a website. My website is KICRestoration.com. Or please, if you want to email, for all you emailers out there, my email address is info at KICRestoration.com. Dot com, Or please, you can give my corporate headquarters office a call. Our office hours are from 7 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. And that number is 858-859-1998. Wow. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking time. I know you're a busy guy and for you to get over here to our office and into our studio. Very much appreciated and fabulous episode. Really good information you've passed on to our listeners. Well, that will conclude today's show. I would like to make a quick plug to post a positive review. If you can please take the time for our Property Management Brainstorm podcast, it will make our day and pay it forward and encourage more great guests like Jason to come onto our show and uh, be with us for your listening pleasure. Thank you to everyone joining the Property Management Brainstorm podcast who are listening today. Until next time, here at North County Property Group, we will be in the field working hard for our clients to maximize their property value rental income and maintain top tenant relations and we will see you next time. Thank you.